cryptocurrencies, derived from the Greek word kryptos, meaning hidden or secret. Are cryptocurrencies the new hidden gem of investment, or are they a secret that should probably stay that way? In this program, I lift the lid on this very new digital asset class and interview some of the pioneers of the movement. And the really cool thing is, this asset class is so new, you still effectively have the opportunity to be a pioneer too. My name is Marcus de Maria, and I've been investing and trading the markets over 17 years. And for about the last decade, I've been training thousands of others to do it too. I have done a bit of trading with cryptocurrencies, but now I want to learn more, and I'm going to take you on that journey. And um, thank you so much for your time. Delighted to be here. So tell me, um, what do you think? What, what, what are cryptocurrencies? What is a blockchain and why is it so important? Well, uh, cryptocurrencies emerge um, effectively, they're a form of electronic cash. And what's extraordinary about them is that effectively we've solved a problem which had existed in computer science for a long time um, of being able to send an electronic cash transaction um, trustlessly without there being a central issuer and being sure that the transaction would not be replicated or double spent effectively. So what, uh, what, what uh, emerges with Bitcoin in 2008, 2009 is, is effectively the resolution of this problem. What do you mean by, by double spent? Well, you know, historically without a central issuer that you trust, um, you, couldn't, you couldn't send a transaction to someone of an electronic cash unit um, without being sure that they might um, send the same transaction again effectively. So what, what uh, Satoshi Nakamoto came up with is this idea of a blockchain where the transactions are taken effectively um, and put into a block and you have um, miners who are running the Bitcoin program, if you like, um, competing with each other to solve a mathematical problem and find the key to a block. So they gather all the transactions and at the same time they're competing giving power to the network to find the problem to a block. And since they're competing, you don't know who is going to find the, the, the solution. Once the solution to the math problem is found, a block is formed, and then you have a chain of blocks. So then all the miners start working on the next block. So the longest chain is always the, the current one. And because, um, you know, because a transaction has been taken into a block, and that is the longest chain, you look back and you say, well, that transaction is in that block, and then it's in another block, and in another block, and after a series of blocks, you can say that the transaction is valid because the, the possibility of it being repeated is extremely low after six blocks. And then it can't be spent again? Like that you, you cannot send the same transaction again. You can't do a double spend. Because before the blockchain, before this insight of the blockchain, which takes in various insights from maths and cryptography, it's a sort of multidisciplinary solution that, that Satoshi came up with, um, we could never figure out a way of having a trustless, permissionless electronic cash, a sort of digital gold, if you like, uh, without having a bank or a central, a central trusted intermediary that said, yes, this is my ledger and only things that come from me are valid. Now we have effectively a decentralized, distributed ledger in the sky, a global decentralized ledger showing the transactions. So the, the fact that everyone can see them means that everyone can be sure that they're not being double spent. And the fact that there is mining means that there is effectively proof of work for every block so that you have proved you have done the work to say that the transactions are valid. It's very interesting because when you mention things like in the sky, I remember you know, when cloud first came about, I was dead against it and now I wouldn't live without it. Um, do you think people can trust something that's in the sky? Well, I think people do trust things in the sky every day and, and effectively you know, our, our consciousness is changing and I think we are increasingly becoming more digitally conscious and less there is less and less consciousness in a way that is physical and of course one can lament that philosophically but that is a fact and you know we live as, as sort of digital nomads through a series of services and interactions and we have if you like multiple personalities on multiple different digital levels so I think that that ship has sailed. 
Now, you're probably thinking, a load of lines of code flying through the internet at light speed representing value that I've earned. That doesn't sound particularly safe. But what if I told you that the very reason that these cryptocurrencies were created was to create a safer way to transfer value? For Bitcoin, the very first cryptocurrency, this was their primary goal. And in this program, our main focus will be on Bitcoin as it is the most widely recognized cryptocurrency and it has also been around the longest. But remember, the principles are broadly the same across most of the cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoins are digital coins you can send through the internet and in comparison to other more traditional alternatives, Bitcoins have a number of advantages. Bitcoins are transferred directly from person to person via the net without going through a bank or clearinghouse. This means that they are not country specific. The fees are much lower and there are not any prerequisites such as minimum amounts in your account. There are no arbitrary limits such as a maximum amount in your account and your account cannot be frozen. Also, it all happens at a fraction of the time. Cheaper and faster, what's there not to like? So, if I were looking to make money in this mm. and invest, mm. what would be the best way to go about doing that? Mm. Well, so the best investment advice with all of this stuff is go back in time to about 2011 or buy a lot of Bitcoin. Uh, and you know, that's really pretty good advice. You know, if you're going to be investing in the future, you're going to be taking risk. The cryptocurrency arena has enormous amounts of risk, technical risk, political risk, regulatory risk, risk of competition from the future. We don't really know the fundamental valuation of all of these assets. Um, I think the only dependable bets are the ones you would have had to make a long time ago. From here on out, I think the price performance is likely to be compatible with other areas of high-tech innovation. Uh, and think of biotech. Somebody is going to make a trillion dollars, everyone else is going to lose their shirts. It's probably more like that than the S&P 500. So what about the current incumbents, you know, the Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, etc., the big market caps? So are they the best bet at the moment? Well, I mean, right now those companies are all tiny, right? I mean, Bitcoin is a company, but it's tiny and it's, you know, whatever it is, 130, 150 billion. Uh, what's the total value of all the gold in the world? Eight to nine trillion. Right. So is it big yet? After transactions are verified, they are recorded in a transparent public ledger, which is basically a very large spreadsheet with all the transactions recorded on it. And why would anyone spend time and effort solving these mathematical problems? Well, as a reward for solving these problems, the individuals are given newly generated bitcoins. At the most basic level, bitcoin is just a ledger, with account numbers and balances, a very, very big spreadsheet, which all those who solve the mathematical problems to verify transactions have a copy of. When Jim sends Emily 10 bitcoins, Emily's account goes up by 10 bitcoins and Jim's goes down by 10 bitcoins. There's no gold or government issued money backing these numbers, just people's belief that the numbers are worth something. So, how does the system prevent unfair changes? Well, it's all in the ledger. And in the world of cryptocurrency, the ledger is called the blockchain. Every time you hit send, your e-wallet sends a message to the Bitcoin network describing how the ledger should change, including the amount to transfer and the senders and recipients account numbers. Professor Manili, thank you very much for your time. So, can you tell me a little bit about your involvement in the whole cryptocurrency and blockchain world? It's oh, yeah. a good question, Marcus. Um, our involvement began about uh, 22, 23 years ago. We were building distributed ledgers, as I prefer to call them rather than blockchains, but we were building distributed ledgers for secure document transfer systems. And the advantage was that we had a distributed system, which is therefore inherently resilient, like the internet. You, you can take out nodes, but you can't take out the system. 
And the second thing that we wanted to do was to ensure that the records couldn't be altered by anybody. And so we, we did what's called chaining. We took hashes of various documents and put them into the subsequent documents. And that's really effectively all you're looking at, a multi-organizational database with a super audit trail. That's what a distributed ledger or blockchain is. Uh, blockchains are only one form, really, of distributed ledger. Cryptocurrencies, though, are, are rather different. So putting a cryptocurrency on top of a distributed ledger is an application. So you're taking a multi-organizational database and you're saying, I would like to have little tokens, virtual elements, if you call them, with identity on them. And here's a number for you, and you send some numbers back to me, and we send them on to somebody else. What we make of those numbers, though, is up to us. Um, my firm has been researching this area um, for quite some time, and in fact, we put out some publications in 2011, for example, on what this might mean for commerce, uh, for trade architectures. I do see this as a transformative technology, but not necessarily revolutionary, if I can draw that distinction. It's a, um, it's a bit like databases, which uh, I said earlier, these are multi-organizational databases with a super audit trail, and we didn't see this enormous database revolution as consumers in the 70s when they come out. Um, but we did feel the effects of it, so I'm hoping in the future people won't be talking about blockchain and distributed ledgers unless they're technologists like we. Like a check, Bitcoin requires a signature on each message to prove that it was created by the true owner of those coins. But you guessed it, this is no ordinary, easily forgeable handwritten signature. This is a signature based on maths. In Bitcoin's case, cryptography has been repurposed to prove ownership. Every time someone sends money, a transaction message is sent all around the world to people who want to help maintain the blockchain. And these people are known as miners. Miners have a copy of the blockchain and update it whenever they receive a new transaction with a valid signature. With ledgers spread all over the world, traffic delays and occasionally fraud can lead to differences in those ledgers. So how does the world decide which version to use? Well, like in a democracy, there is a vote. And how does someone vote? They solve the puzzle. The puzzle is a kind of mathematical race, but instead of being designed to favor the winner, it is designed to favor the majority's version. This is because the more people there are working on a particular version, the faster it will be solved. The puzzles are extraordinarily special in that they are no tricks to solving them faster other than by buying more computers and electricity. Now, outsolving the majority would require outspending the majority, which is not very attractive. Now, I know you have a big question. Why would anyone spend his or her time, money, and resources on maintaining a ledger? And the answer is because they will earn money, well, value. Look, every time a code is deciphered, a small award is added to the miner's balance, effectively creating money. This award acts as an incentive for people to help maintain the blockchain and how new value enters the market. But an important factor to remember is that within the system, a miner's main purpose is to manage the blockchain and not to create value. The voting system simply provides a convenient way to distribute money into the world. After 2140, no more money will be created at all. I'll give you a good example. I was talking to um, a chap a couple of weeks ago and um, a friend of his um, had got involved with someone in Monaco who had a swimming pool and was complaining about the cost of heating a swimming pool. So he said, well, I'll tell you what I do, I need to do some mining. Can I put some, a miner in under your swimming pool in your garage and you can use the heat to heat your swimming pool? He said, what are you talking about? He said, well, don't worry about that, I'll pay you something for doing it. So long story short, he was Bitcoin mining, using the excess heat to heat the guy's swimming pool. The price of Bitcoin um, at that stage, it fell in value, he stopped doing mining. Three years later, he goes back to see his friend in Monaco and says, oh, I bet you're really pleased about that mining. He goes, I never understood what you were talking about. What, what do you mean? He said, well, you've got the bit of paper. I told you to put it in the safe, and he went to the safe. 
punched into the internet and he said, well, do you know your Bitcoin is worth $24 million? He said, what, what about your Bitcoin, Bitcash? What, what are you talking about? It was another $8 million. So-called sophisticated investors, very wealthy individual. Now, if that can happen at that level, you know, you can see the problems and some of the issues that, if you like, the man lady in the street will, will run into. And, and a lot of people say, well, yeah, but the whole cryptocurrency, it's a scam, it's a con, it's not real, I can't touch it, you know, you'll lose your value. Well, look, let's look what's happened to the US dollar in the last 80 years. It's declined in value by over 80%. You know, and if you look at what happens to companies that are being floated in the UK or the US, you know, in excess of 60% are bust, gone, disappeared within five years. So it's not going to be any different with cryptocurrencies. There'll be some good ones and some bad ones. You know, one company I, I you know, often mention is a company called Ripple, which many people have never heard of. It's backed by a hundred of the biggest banks. Um, according to the FT last week, they've now got a $15 billion war chest, which they want to go out and on the acquisition trail and build their business. And what do they do? They're basically finding a way to disintermediate, take the friction out in the banking world. So when Barclays sends money to um, HSBC, they reckon that by using the Ripple platform, they can actually cut the costs by 40 or 50% quite easily. And when you talk about the trillions a day that are tra being transferred to cut the costs out of money transfer, you can see why something like Ripple, um, or c perhaps you can understand why Ripple has gone up by over 3,000% in the last year. It, it's it's going to change that industry quite significantly, and it's whoever can crack it is going to make a lot of money. You're now probably feeling a little bit more familiar with the concept of cryptocurrencies, but how can you take advantage of this? Now for some, the word volatile is frightening, but for others who know how to embrace volatility, the word is exciting. In terms of trading and investing on the stock or other markets, if something is volatile, then it means there is a lot of movement. And where there is movement, there is the opportunity to make money, or indeed, potentially lose it, of course. So what's your particular interest in this? Well, my particular interest is that um, having set up literally from, from, a, from a bedroom um, in London a, a, a business managing people's money, um, and I thought I was frightfully clever by going out and buying a, cup, a TV with Teletext because I was 15 minutes delayed getting the price of um, what was going on in the stock markets as opposed to buying the FT tomorrow, and it was 24 hours late. Um, and that evolved into managing people's money, um, and then I went on and um, basically floated the company and we ended up with over a billion under management. Um, but it, was, it seemed to me that people didn't understand the risks that they were getting in. And when you actually try to explain, like, for example, most people think investing in foreign exchange is, is, is really, really risky and um, shouldn't be touched at all. The reality is that the ups and downs, the zigs and zags, the volatility, or as investment professionals talk about, the standard deviation returns, actually something like foreign exchange is much, much less volatile than maybe putting your money into the equity market. So some very fundamental basics which the press have tried to educate and teach the people, but most people have got no idea because they're never really taught. They we never really explain the benefits of pound cost averaging. Now pound cost averaging, as an example, is, is a brilliant mechanism because if you just put in, let's say, you know, ten pounds a month into something, but you want that Thing to be going up and down because when it's down you'll buy lots of units and when it's up you perhaps buy one or two units. But if the overall direction is going that, that way, something that's very, very volatile is brilliant for a regular savings contract. So it's absolutely fantastic for your pension. And that's where I see you know, this, this idea of cryptocurrencies actually being a digital pension for many, many people. And once you've built up a reasonable stake, a reasonable depends on your circumstances, but it might be five or ten thousand pounds, you take your money out of that volatile asset class and you put it into something perhaps a little less volatile. So it's very, very basic, very simple concepts. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. So ideally you don't go and buy just one cryptocurrency. You, you look to have a spread of a number of them in a, in, in a fund or a portfolio. Unlike gold or silver, cryptocurrency's worth ranges dramatically from place to place. To a Nepalese goat herder, for example, a cryptocurrency is just about worthless. But for anyone interested in trading and investing, they'll jump on a good cryptocurrency opportunity because it has value to them. It's these factors that create the volatility unseen ever before.
So what action can you take? Well, it's quite simple. Start investing in the more recognized ones. And this program comes with a huge risk disclaimer that past performance is not an indication of future results. Investing carries a large degree of risk and this is the most risky market that you could possibly ever get into. Now, personally, I own about 25 different types of cryptocurrencies but I definitely didn't take my entire life savings and put them all into cryptocurrencies. Whilst the market is this volatile, this is definitely not a good plan. But what I will say is that small investments with a little bit of experience, knowledge and sometimes luck can generate some great rewards. In 2013, Bitcoin went up from $3 a coin to $140 a coin in the space of, well, why don't you guess? Nine months, 12 months, six months, a year? Surely not as little as three months. You're right, of course, it wasn't as little as three months. That would be crazy. Bitcoin went up from three to $140 a coin in one week. Cryptocurrencies are based on collaboration. The more people that know about these currencies, the more people who start to use them in their day-to-day -day life, the more developers you have who create applications that rely on these technologies, the more the network strengthen. And when the network strengthens, the value goes up, just like in the supply and demand model. Thomas, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. So, for you, what are cryptocurrencies and what is the blockchain and why is it so important? To me, it's the biggest shift of my career. I've been working since 1980. I've never seen anything that allows you to trade between two parties without raising an invoice, without having a remittance note and without using a SaaS system or a software system or even going through a bank. You can now trade peer to peer with your smartphones in less than 10 minutes. We've never seen anything like that. Every organization must be terrified. Okay, so but why would somebody watching this right now, why would they care about that? Because at the moment people are putting all of their income through different banks. They're putting their invoices, their purchases, all their credit control, their cash, their deposits, everything is going through a bank. And they're relying on the trust of that bank to hold that, that money, that asset, that capital. And we've got super little apps and super little payment systems and super little desktop systems now to deal with the banks. But we, all of that capital is sitting there not growing. People want their capital to grow. Capital has to work. If capital doesn't work, it just lays idle. If you choose to put your capital into a cryptocurrency, whichever one it might be, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, any particular one of which there's probably over a thousand now, we're looking at a situation very similar to dot-com, 1997, the dot-com bubble, 1997 to 2001. Very, very similar where blockchain is e-commerce. Do you remember the e-commerce ads and the sun.com ads and the IBM e-business ads? So e-commerce is now blockchain another transaction system. What we haven't seen yet is any one of these currencies uh, emerge into being uh, a Google, an Amazon, a Facebook. And if we look back to 1997, that was really before Google and before Facebook. We only really had Amazon back then. But what if it turns out that Bitcoin, Ethereum and Ripple are in fact Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and they grow by a thousand times over the next 20 years. Now, Amazon floated in May 1997. By May 2017, its share price had gone up a thousand times. That's a million percent. Imagine if that happens to Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple by 2037. A thousand times growth. That's why people should care about these currencies. Because I think it may have already happened. But people don't realise it has. And one of the wonderful things I like about Bill Gates' book, The Road Ahead, which is about 25 years ago, that book, 
is he talked about that, the fact that people always overestimate the beginning of a market and underestimate the end of a market. There are lots of opportunities out there. You just have to take them. The only advice I'm going to give you is that there are a lot of different groups and a lot of different people that you can get involved with, follow and learn from. Get tuned into this information and benefit from the knowledge.